Hello everybody, and welcome back to another realistic automation guide design. And today, we'll be looking at American 1950s cars. Now, um, there was a Lua error every time I looked at the body for like more than like a minute. So I'm just going to get past that because I am just I just want to make the video. Because if you see that, it's just whatever. Alright, first up, of course, the body. We have JD7450s, the 108 inch wheelbase and 119 inch wheelbase. I'd recommend using these the most because, well, they, 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 they look the most like it, of course. And uh, body editor 50s large. This is a good idea for something like a big Cadillac limousine. It's a 128 inch wheelbase. That's like a Fleetwood. Um, <laughs> you could probably use it another for another Halo car. Halo car is basically like the, well, the big, the most luxurious car you could get. So I'd probably get that for that. And then this for a standard car, the 119 inch wheelbase and 108. Uh, and 100 inch. I'd say maybe use these two for compacts because there were compact cars in the 50s. The Independents actually had fifth compacts like uh, the Nash Rambler. That was a compact. Uh, that first compact that comes out of my mind. But that was kind of popular and it still went on. <coughs> That's all the things, isn't it? Oh, shit. Uh, panel material. Steel, Woody's beer being phased out. Yeah. Steel is always the go-to. Was good old American steel. Woody's, I... I think they were phased out along the mid-50s, so like Suburbans and Station Wagons could be full steel during then. Uh, fiberglass, as far as I could remember, the Chevy Corvette was the only car made from fiberglass. And that's not, um, that's a, that's a sports slash muscle car, sort of, not a regular car. Uh, chassis type ladder, of course. Unibody. I didn't mention this last video, but there actually was one unibody car, the Nash 600. That was like the first American unibody car, and it was big because it was unibody. It was like the first car to use it, and Nash actually still used it in the Rambler. And I think another compact car in the 50s used unibody. I can't think of it, or I'm thinking of the 60s. I'm, I'm thinking of the Falcon. Never mind, that's the 60s. But yeah, maybe unibody for like a small compact car, for like a one-off, like a Rambler, but just keep the ladder. Of course, steel chassis, these cars rusted when you touch them, and galvanized steel, tell you only front longitudinal. The front suspension. Uh, front suspension in the 50s is interesting because uh, they went from all dependent in from front to like semi-independent and independent in the front. Because they did have like a single and double wishbone. Uh, actually here, someone had semi independent torsion suspension. That's what it was. That was actually like a big thing. It was like early, early mid 50s. It was early to mid 50s that they had a torsion suspension in the front. Not just in the rear, but in the front. And uh, that's what I, that's actually what I want automation to add. Just because torsion suspension in the front. But um, instead, of, instead of torsion, you could just go double wishbone like I did. Uh, really, This is an early 50s design. I'd say probably just go for coil and then in the mid-50s do double wishbone for torsion. But this car is sort of like in the upper class, like Oldsmobile, Chrysler, stuff like that. So it's, yeah, they, they're just double wishbone all the time. Uh, rear suspension, solid axle leaf only because of the Hotchkiss drive system. It wasn't just suspension, it was a drive system. Because of the way that allowed a leaf spring system, dependent system, to work, it, it was used, like, until the 80s, like I said. <coughs> Excuse me. Mm. Uh, for the engines, this is where inline sixes and V8s were your primary source of power. Because, in starting in the early to mid-50s, every manufacturer started going from a flathead 
to push rod overhead valves. And of course that can make it a lot more power. So instead of just having all these different engine designs, they just went to one engine or two engines designs, the inline six and the V8. Uh, you could make an argument where the I4 V12 and V16 could carry over because, you know, you just made the you just made the engine in the 40s and you don't want to throw it away. So it's like, yeah, you can still use it. Uh, block and heads are cast iron. You might get the option for aluminum, if anything, but there was no, I'm pretty sure there was no aluminum heads from the factory in the 50s. Uh, let's see here. Displacement, 2.5 to 4 liter, 153 cubic inch, 244 cubic inch inline 6, or a 244 cubic inch, 366 cubic inch V8. And really that V, big V8, again, is Cadillac. Because Cadillac make big engine for big car. Uh, you kind of want to keep that in mind, too. Big engine for big car. Because this is a 277 cubic inch V8. And it makes 121 nets. It's actually not a lot in the 50s. But it's a little restrictive. Let's see why. Uh, of course cast iron everything you might see a forged crank but they didn't use forged anything uh, here of course tune it as much as you can do as high rpms as you can go as well because uh it's sort of it's in like the early muscle car years i want to say it's not full muscle car but they're making as much power as they can go and it's like getting there, you know. Uh, compression, I'll get to that here in a bit. Uh, compression is because, uh, what was the fuel? 79, 85, 55, and then 55, 87, regular, 94. Because the in, because you had 87 octane regular for a while, but the engines wouldn't tune for 87 octane until. 55 I'm pretty sure according to automobile catalog research I did on because the compression was like low in 53 and 54 and then compressions just jumps in 55 and the way I got that it was like you put the ignition timing all the way like down here and for like low compression and if you put it to here it, it's it's actually you know yeah it's 87 so that's why I figure uh, of course if it's an in, if it's a inline, it gets a single barrel carburetor, and if it's a V, it gets a two barrel carburetor at the minimum. But uh, fun fact: this is the era where we actually get a four barrel carburetor. As you can see here, it was invented by Holly actually in 1952 for GM cars, and then in 1955, other manufacturers got it. Like in the Chrysler 331 Hemi, the Ford's uh, Thunderbird and stuff like that, it got a four barrel. And then, of course, like the Corvette and whatever got a four barrel as well. Uh, but the thing is, you won't get a four barrel unless you put the tech pool to plus four. So just do that first if you're going to do that. Switch it back to this engine. Uh, intake manifold. Just keep it standard, mid, or low. I wouldn't say compact, because you're making a lot more horsepower. Uh, configuration for carburetors. I couldn't find any early... Car I couldn't find any early 50s engines. Or really at all, with more than one carb. Uh, hot rods, of course, use like s three single-barrel carburetors. So you could like do that if you want to make a hot rod. No. Uh, exhaust, a uh, compact cast was still being used in the 50s, but cast low was sort of like a, uh, performance option. Like, I've got a setup for, like, a performance engine and a, what do you call it, a luxury engine that uses cast low, so I'd say use that. Uh, first muffler, probably <coughs> not. And then second muffler, of course, use second muffler. Baffled, probably just used for like a regular engine. Reverse flow, that's for like luxury, you know. 
Uh, did I miss anything? Let me check. Config, manifold, injection. Oh, yeah! There was actually a manifold fuel injection. In 1957, Bendix made a fuel injection system that was used in some V8 performance models, such as AMC's 327V8, Chrysler's 360, and GM had a different Rochester uh, from 57 to 62. That Bendix system was only used one year in 57, though. Because they, cause they had it one year, and then they stopped using it. Because it was actually unreliable. At, like, half as reliable as carburetors. So they just kept using carburetors. And, uh, GM, they only had it on the Corvette from 57 to 62... And in 63, they replaced it with, like, two four-barrels, three two-barrels, stuff like that. So you could put fuel injection into it, but it, it, probably for, like, one year, go all in like GM did. But GM has GM money. So it's like, uh, no. Uh, and also, fuel injection is only used on the performance models as well. So keep that in mind. Uh, I do have uh, tips for uh, designs this time, actually, and I'll go over them. Because as you could see, this is a 58 model, and that, it looks like a rocket ship. Uh, there's actually two other things. In 57 or 50, mid, late 50s, the bumpers had these like little indents on them as sort of like a protector. Uh, these dual headlights, that actually started in 58, because the government, like, unbanned the use of dual headlights, and everybody in 1958 used them, so you get this little thing. Oh, uh, one mirror, still only a thing. Brake lights, still only a thing. Tail fins, tail fins are a must. Especially for, like, a, I don't know, I, any car, honestly. Uh, lots of chrome, like that. Uh, white tops were very much a thing. These they look nice, and uh, oh yeah, just I'd say beginning in the mid fifties, make it look like a rocket ship. In the early fifties, though, I'd say kind of get cute designs from the forties where it just looks basic, like uh, this one if it'll load in, like this one. It looks very basic. The single headlights, you got turn signals, you got. Bumpers, taillights, you know, a little bit of chrome. There's a little bit of pizzazz, but not much. There's some, but it's not a lot. Just don't go too crazy, like in 58. 58, you can absolutely go crazy. I'd say actually beginning in 56, you could probably go crazy, but yeah. Excuse <coughs> 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 Rear-wheel drive only, three-speed standard, four speeds for three-plus overdrive, and a two-speed automatic option actually was a thing starting in the early 50s, yeah, because it had a proper torque converter and everything instead of just, you know, it being like some sort of semi-automatic like the fluid drive or weird torque converter like the fluid drive. But this is it. There's a true... Automatic. Uh, three and four speeds. These could stay around the previous 3.8 to 4.4 final gearing. Performance gears can go higher. This begins for 3.6, 2.6 to 2.8 for performance for three speeds, for performance for four speeds. For autom for two speed automatics, they're a little wonky. Oh, did I miss? No. They're a little wonky because uh, this is actually a little bit longer because they were like 3.5 for the final drive, like a 1.76 to 86 for this first. And then the second gear ratio is always a 1.0. Uh, the 0 to 60s apparently were way better according to Automobile Catalog, but I don't believe it. Because you got a two-speed automatic, you're, you're shifting like on a power glide. You're, you're not going to get speed unless you have the horsepower. This thing that has 121 horsepower is not going to get speed. Uh, 
Yes. Actually, that's not for base. 125, 145, 90C, 1415s for base. That should be more for less compact, so not base. 145, 165, 90C, 1516s for standards, yeah. 165, 185, 90C, 16s for luxury, yeah. Like 165, 85, C, 16s. That is... It's actually sort of a realistic tire size. There's a... One thing I could recommend is actually looking at a realistic tire size chart and just kind of going there if you're going like hyper realism or whatever for your tires because it's very wonky of how automation does them. Brakes, 10 to 12 inch drums depending on the rim, you know, 10 to 11 on 15 inches, 11 to 12 on 16 inches. Uh, two leading shoes. Get that as soon as you can, because two, two leading shoes has actually been around for a while. I read a Model T could actually have a two leading shoe in the 20s, so it's like, yeah, well, why not have them, you know? And of course, still very manual braking. Uh, I put 35 on there to be a little better, to be manual, not hydraulic and whatnot. Uh, ignore arrow. Uh, of course, the standard uh benches front and rear benches they still had uh, couches as seats i don't know how else to describe it i had couches as seats interiors just don't go race or sport or something like that because yeah no race or sports cars entertainment am radios were still optional phonographs uh, that that that's technically optional, but that's like a weird option to go with. A very weird option to go with. Uh, if you're going with manual steering, keep with the manual articulating ball. Because even if you have a unibody, keep the articulating ball because it's great if you don't have power steering. And the hydraulic being an option, starting the early to mid 50s, yeah, I'd say probably like 52, 53, hydraulic steering was an option. So around then, you get that. Of course, standard 50s, because, uh... Bumpers and front panels, car, front passengers. Yeah, because just front passengers had lap seat belts. Because in the 50s, they actually started to give out seat belts, but they were just the lap seat belts that really protect against nothing. I've ridden in a car with lap seat belts, and it feels like you're riding. You don't even have a seat belt on, because you just don't even feel that seat belt. It's kind of funny. It feels dangerous, but it's it's, it's fun. Uh, springs, standard, of course. Progressive. Uh, what was it? Progressive is technically a heavy-duty suspension option. Yeah, like uh, police package options. They had a heavy-duty suspension. That's what a progressive suspension could be because of how they work. It is the... It's a very spring rate. Yeah, it's a heavy-duty spring rate. Uh, blap, blap. Sway bars, no sway bars. Buick had front stabilizers in the late fifties. Yeah, Buick, because Buick had full double wishbone suspension, and so they could have like a stabilizer. It wasn't like a sway bar, but it was a stabilizer. And of course, get this baby as low as you can go. And uh, yeah, that's about it. This is actually a fully optioned out car in the late fifties. More or less. This isn't... I wouldn't say this is really a base model. This is a very optioned out. If you want to look at a little bit of a base model, you can look at this. Because this still has a uh, inline six in it. Actually, look at this inline six. See, yeah, check it out. It's an inline six. The ignition timing's retarded. It's got a single barrel. The intake manifold is standard. I'd recommend going standard low instead of compact, just for the horsepower. Exhaust, compact, still, baffled, yeah. In line 6, it's got a 3-speed manual. No. Uh, like, 3-speed, uh, like, be like this. 356, 290, 170, 1 with the 3-speed manual. Wheels. These are actually bigger than the ones I've got, but it's... Like I said, automation's weird with the tires. 
drums 11 inches 1 to 15 inch standard no entertainment because that's an optional manual circulating ball you don't have that you don't have progressive springs and everything so yeah i'd say that's enough for the guide right now and of course if you want this it's in the description and i'll try to go with anything i missed or got wrong in the description again so yeah Thank you for watching.